regard to female voice. And uh, it's, uh, it was it culminated in, in, in the creation of a book. It's the first of its type, and so I, I don't know that they have copies of it here, but I thought I would bring one just to let you see if you wanted more information about that. There's been quite a bit of information about male changing voices. Um, John Cooksey did a lot of that research, and you might know of his name. Um, John and I used to do workshops together in Minnesota for the Voice Care Network. And so uh, that sort of prompted my interest in this many, many, many years ago. And so anyway, I hope that this morning will uh, dispel some, some myths for you and maybe um, affirm some of the things that you, that you know about this young voice. Let me ask you first and foremost, how many of you uh, work with uh, middle school choirs? All of you, I assume. How many of you work with children's choirs? And the reason I ask is because we're finding that, that voice change is occurring earlier and earlier. And so when we used to think about children's choirs going up to sixth grade, that did not include changed voices. But now we're seeing, uh, since the onset for many children, especially females, is, is now uh, as early as eight years old to ten years old, that we're seeing some, um, some indications of voice change earlier in the early. So, um, I think the adolescent voice for most of us in music education particularly has um, it, always been a challenge. And part of that challenge was due to lack of knowledge. Um, it's, it, a lot of our methods classes would give us information about the voice in general, but not about vocal development. And the other thing was just poor preparation in, 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 our, in our education as far as teachers was concerned. I'm thankful that this is changing. When I was at LSU eons ago, there was a book uh, by Dr. Erwin Cooper called Teaching Junior High School Music. It was kind of, you, you shake your head, you might know what I'm talking about, green book paper. But anyway, uh, it was the only one of its kind. And there was quite a bit of information about dealing with junior high singers, and, and it's, it's still very valid, I think. More information about uh, male changing voice, just a little bit of information about female changing voice in there. Uh, interestingly enough, Cooper was uh, John Cootsie's um, mentor and teacher at Florida State. Um, the male adolescent voice, as I said, over the past 50 years has been the study of much, much, um, uh, the subject of much study. The various stages of maturation, uh, characteristics of each stage, methods of voice classification. We're not talking tenor base, but rather where they are in classification of change. Strategies for teaching these young men, and the psychological ramifications. And you say, well, what is that about? Psychological ramifications from the standpoint that, um, uh, you know, boys that are in a boy choir, um, there's a lot of identity and a lot of uh, social connection to being in that choir. And when the voice begins to change, sometimes there's some real psychological resistance to that. Likewise, guys don't like to be associated with the higher pitch uh, sound with the young ladies. And so psychologically, they're kind of like, oh, I don't like to sing, you know. So there's psychological issues involved in, in both of them. Um, Pedagogues such as Father William Finn, 1939, he wrote a book called The Art of the Choral Conductor. When I was first looking uh, at information about this young voice or, or seeking information, this is one place that I looked. And um, this gentleman um, was the, the teacher of um, Roger, oh my goodness, Roger, Roger Wagner, who was the teacher of uh, Paul Salmanovich. And so it, it goes back a while, but in that book I remember reading, and the female voice also changes, though not as drastically as that of the brother. And that was about all it said about girls' voices. Um, <laughs> Duncan McKenzie is another pedagogue that um, worked, he came up with a plan called the Alto Tenor Plan, if you've ever heard about that, about how the voice drops all the way down and then it comes back up. And uh, yeah, that was based on his work with voice. Erwin Cooper, I've already mentioned at Florida State, Dr. Cooper is, is associated with the term cambiata, if you've heard of that. As a matter of fact, in Conway, Arkansas, there's a, a thing called Cambiata Press. And uh, that was started by a student of his, another student of his, Don Collins. It still, still does, and Don has a really, really valid um, book for junior high and teaching choral, choral music called Choral Conducting. But it focuses on the, on the adolescent and, uh, voice. And then Frederick Swanson. And Swanson and McKenzie used to go back and forth in the Music Educators Journal about this is what I believe, and you know that you know it, it has to be this way. And they had diametrically opposed views. It's kind of interesting to read some of their work. But anyway, all of these folks worked extensively with these young voices, and they offered various theories about what was going on, 
with those, that, that development. And you would think, you know, boy choirs predate, I mean, all the way back to the end of boy choir, and, uh, the boy choirs of the Catholic Church. You would think that there were, was a lot of research or, or understanding of that voice. Um, in Europe, they talk about the male voice breaking, um, and that's, that's the cracks in, in, in the, the actual change process. In this country, we don't really try not to talk about breaking, and it sounds like it's something that's really broken. And in fact, what's really happening is just transition through maturation. John Cooksey, as I mentioned, uh, he is the only one that's done ongoing research on the male adolescent voice. Um, there's the, he's the one that's the only, done the only longitudinal study in this country. It's based off of a study by Daniel Weiss in Germany. It was came out in the 1960s, um, where it was, a, it was a longitudinal study over a five-year period, looking at the same guys um, and studying their voices. And I think that's where we gleaned the best, the best information. Uh, he identified five stages of voice change, and Cooksey, those five, five stages were also identified by Weiss. Kutsi has taken them and even done further research and given them names. Uh, Mid-voice one would be that changing, you know, when you hear the little boys' voices that, that sound more like altos, but they're not really sopranos anymore, a little huskiness. Mid-voice one, mid-voice two. Two A would be a tantamount to the cambiata, a real changing voice. New baritone, not to be considered with the, the adult baritone, and then the developing baritone, still not to be considered with the adult baritone. And you think, well, you know, don't they just change? Well, yeah, they do, but there's a gradual change that occurs. And so even this developing baritone, which I would categorize most of our boys that are, you know, 15, 16 years old, freshman, sophomore in high school, that would be your developing baritones, maybe even some seniors in high school. I said yesterday in, some, in, in a couple of the sessions, talking about voice change, that the voice does not reach total maturity until the late 20s. And so even then, every seven to 10 years, the human voice changes all the way through the lifespan of the individual. So what we're really talking about is the high point of mutation. This is a secondary sex characteristic. Um, voice change as well as, as development of, of, the, of the adolescent physically, they all sort of link in together, they're hormonally induced, um, and therefore we see the predominance of this change process occurring both boys and girls right at this puberty level. Dr. Gackle? Yes, sir. How long does he say that generally, and it's probably individual, but generally how long does that five-stage process? Uh, it, well, you're going to hear a young man, and I have John Tate here, where he, he worked with one, one guy, and it goes over about a two-and-a-half-year period. It can be as quick as, as a several months, a couple of months even. Okay. Um, it can take as long as three years. And as for, of course, to reach that real settled adult stage, many years. But the high point of mutation can be anywhere from months to a year and a half to two years, primarily, if I had to be male down. Now, female voice, likewise, but it's so gradual that we don't notice that as drastically because of that octave phenomenon that we have with the male voice that we don't have with the female voice. And I've seen girls' voices change over a period of three to four years. It seems like it takes a little bit longer, though it starts early. Um, with female adolescent voice change, comparatively little study has been devoted to the voice, and that's the reason I wrote this book. People kept saying, you know, you've been doing this for 34 years, maybe you need to write it down. And so I did, and it's certainly not the, uh, the, the, the end all to, to this information, but I have to tell you it's the only information out there that's actually published unless you want to go through research. Um, and most of the research studies and articles are in uh, like linguistics and medical research as opposed to music or music education research. <coughs> what prompted this for me was in 1984, I was in Miami, Florida, young teacher working with this group, the Miami Girl Choir. Um, and uh, the Miami Boy Choir at that time had already sung at some ACBA conventions. It was a very fine group. And, and the way I got started was I was teaching theory to the boys and they had a little girl choir and it was basically the little sisters of this community children's choir. And uh, so the, the director of that group left. And so the director of the boy choir says, you know, this, you need to maybe consider conducting this girl's choir because it's just going to be limited by the mind of its conductor. Now, I'm a, I'm a sucker for things like that. So I said, sure, I'll do it. And uh, when I got in front of them the first time, I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, this isn't like those boys' voices. Well, how do you tune breath? I mean, this is the brain. <laughs> Cooper book, you know, help me out, you know, nobody, 
there's nothing, nothing written. I'm going, oh my goodness. So um, anyway, I submitted the tape, to the tape, that <laughs> shows you how old this is, um, <laughs> to the Gibby and Secret Convention in Chicago that year. The girls were accepted, which made me real happy. And then at the end of that letter, it said, and we would also like for you to present a 45 minute demonstration on female adolescent voice. Um, I didn't ask for that. Uh, I think things happen um, in fortuitous ways. And, and so, that prompted me to begin to write down some of the things that I was doing. This is when the Children's Choir movement, if you'll think back, those of you that have done Children's Choir for a while, Doreen Rao, uh, the ACPA began to recognize Children's Choirs in the 80s. Doreen was working with the Glen Ellen Children's Choir at that time, very articulate person. Um, was, you know, and it's just retired from Toronto, but was elemental in starting this, this, this um, Children's Choir uh, movement, if you will. And of course, girl choirs um, were something, they're sort of a, a, a new phenomena from the standpoint that in England, for instance, we have the choristers in the cathedrals, most of those have been boy choirs. However, in the early 90s, they started with girl choristers in the UK. And now we have two distinct groups, and that's kind of interesting. There is ongoing research in the UK about female voice. Um, nonetheless, um, I sort of began to write down information and I looked for was, was scouring my books and I knew of this man that John Cooksey with voice choirs and I thought, well, you know, maybe he can help me. So I just cold called him. I just, you know, Dr. Cooksey, you don't know me, but my name is, is Lynn Gathlin. I'd, I'd like to know what you might know or if you could point me in a direction about changing voice in females. And his answer was, you know, young lady, um, I, I'm always asked this question, and I really don't know much about it, and I would encourage you to study it. <laughs> Thank you. It was not the answer I wanted, but you're very kind. And so anyway, um, I uh, put this information together, and that I had been working at this time with the girls for about five years, and uh, wrote an article in 1984, which was published in the journal. That became the basis for my research, basically. Um, John and I subsequently did some research together and did sessions together and as we were talking about male and female voice, we found that there were symptoms of voice change that were common with both males and females. Now, I titled this female change because I was uh, telling John, uh, you know, this, these are the things that I've, I've noticed with young, vo young female voices. He said, interestingly enough, we see the same in male voices. So, I left some little, uh, little lines down here, so you can put down, if you wish, um, some of this information. Decreased and inconsistent range. All of a sudden, you know, boys and girls' voices at eight and nine are basically very similar. If you, uh, I, I use the analogy, if you stood a little eight-year-old boy up here behind the screen and a little nine-year-old girl, or eight-year-old girl behind the screen and had them both sing, you'd be hard-pressed to tell the difference in their voices. They're very, very same. Um, but during this standpoint, from the standpoint of mutation, in both voices, um, the range, which is that nice and fluty and that unchanged voice, begins a little decreased. We lose a, lot of to a little bit of the top in both male and female voices. And there's an inconsistency. What I mean by that is that, you know, we, we know that from here to here are pretty strong. But with girls' voices and boys' voices, all of a sudden there's a little breathiness. Some days that just doesn't seem clear. Uh, it's inconsistent. They can't hit some of the notes they used to hit. There's a breathiness and huskiness of tone in both of these voices. And if you think about junior high voices in general, what's the first uh, characteristic? Breathiness. Breathiness. Um, and, and so that, that's just part and parcel of what's going on with the, with the voice. Um, and I think that I, I don't have time to get into this, but there, to understand what's going on with the voice helps. And I do have a little handout that I will refer to, but there's a reason for that huskiness. And it's an anatomical reason. Um, and part of that is just the, the development of the, the vocal apparatus, especially the cartilages called the interarytenoid cartilages. They don't close adequately, spe specifically in the back. And so we have a wispiness or breathiness of air <coughs> because of that poor adduction. In other words, the closing of the vocal cords. And so there's the little air that, that escapes through and gives that breathy quality. Um, voice breaks or voice cracking. We think of that primarily with voice voices, but trust me, girls do it too. And it's so embarrassing. They'll be singing along, all of a sudden, you know, they have that little glitch, and it's just mortifying to them, especially <coughs> in a mixed setting. Um, and I think one of the challenges for us is, is, as 
people who work with this in, in our church choirs or our school choirs is to set up an environment of, of uh, safety and trust. And I try to explain this to kids. You know, if your voice didn't change, something, something would be wrong with you. You know, we'd have to be concerned. But this happens, and it happens to all of us, and it's okay. It's not funny to laugh at somebody. It's not, it doesn't mean that their voice is bad. It just means their voice is changing, and these things happen. And it will cease to happen after a while as the voice continues to change. It's normal. Transition notes, the appearance of visagio. Um, and I noted this for girls' voices, particularly around middle, uh, above middle C and around G is the first break, and you'll hear this on the recording that I have for you. As well as then the approximation as the voice continues to go through this high point of mutation of the passaggio at the top of the cleft D, E um, for female voices, which most of us adult females deal with a lot. The lowering of speaking voice, certainly in male voices, uh, it's, Dr. Cooksey calls it like a slinky. I mean, it literally goes down a step, you know, this way. With a girl's voice, we also have a lowering of speaking pitch, which you'll hear on my, my CD as well. And it doesn't go down the octave. We don't have that octave displacement. But we still have that, that gradual, steady changing of timbre and lowering of speaking pitch. The, the average uh, speaking pitch for an adult female is approximately A to G below the C. And some of us like me today, who probably needs a cup of coffee and a little warm up, uh, probably about an E or a D. But anyway, that's not necessarily the healthy speaking voice, but it's a habitual right now for me. Insecurity of pitch, the inability to sing into the middle of the, of the tone. Uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but have you ever tried to sing certain keys and have them go out of tune? They'll start it like in the key of F and then they sharp immensely. Uh, I, I think that that has to do with where those little passages or breaks are. And if the piece is, it lies within that break area and has them maneuvering around the passaggio, they tend to either ride it high or ride it low. And so there, there's that insecurity of pitch and inability to sing in the center of pitch, a lot of it based on the previous, um, the appearance of passaggio. Difficulty in phonation, just the, the inability to, <coughs> to, uh, to sing. Some, more, some days they come in, they go, I just can't, I just want to want come out. It just doesn't. You know, and, and well, in Florida, where I did a lot of my, my work as a teacher, would you, our kids swim all year long, and a lot of times they have allergies to chlorine and things like that. And so, wait, have you been swimming? You have an allergy? I don't know. I don't think so. You know, and part of it is, for females particularly, it's hormonally induced. Um, because if they have, you know, it's before the menses, uh, or if they're just about to start that process, um, a lot of times there's water retention or edema. And it does prevent and present itself in the vocal cords. So there's a, a, a veil, a huskiness in the voice, and it makes phonation difficult. The guys exhibit the same thing. A lot of it has to do with the, the changes that are physically going on in the tissues or in the vocal cords themselves and, and the musculature around that, that laryngeal area. And then the, the changes in timbre. We notice that particularly with girls' voices, but we certainly notice it with boys' voices. The timbre from the soprano, the, the voice soprano, to that more alto quality, to the cambiata, to that developing baritone. Likewise with females, that light little fluty soprano sound that becomes a little breathy and, and, and sort of uh, it feels like they, they don't have a lot of control over it. And it's very frustrating to girls. When I used to do this session, I would always bring students of mine. I, I did um, the, the Miami Girl Choir and then I did a group in Tampa. Um, a community group which I had started, and I would bring girls and when I did female voice information to show and demonstrate the various stages. And I remember I had a little girl who was going through this process, and her mother was the president of my board. And uh, you know, mother had said, you know, Mark and Sarah I really wants to quit singing. And I went, no, no, you can't do that. And she said, I said, well, what was the problem? She said, she just feels like she can't sing anymore. Well, here's a kid that had the ability to be on stage at her church, that she would sing solos, and then at school she was in the place. And all of a sudden this change process started, and her, she couldn't depend on her voice. Sometimes she couldn't hit those high notes. We really did play with her head, and she felt, I can't sing anymore. And so I brought her as that example of that 12 and a half year old voice that was going through some of these, these challenges. And it was interesting that afterwards, I would bring the little bitty one all the way to the 15-year-old, and she was right there in the middle. And when she saw this process, and she was part of it, she could hear it, after that presentation, I remember she said, you know, this isn't always going to happen to me, is it? And I said, no. And 
And she said, so I used to sound like this, but I'm going to sound like that eventually. I said, well, maybe not just like that, but yeah, you're just, it's changing. Once she had her head around that, it was like, oh, I can handle this. And she stayed in the choir as well. <laughs> All right, so I created a, a framework for female classification, much like, it's not like John's, but it, it at least gives us some guideposts to get our head around from the standpoint. I do not call this stages for girls' voices, because those, those stages of, of the voice, voice change, you'll hear them, and they're, they're pretty dramatic. Girls' voices are more gradual. They do stay treble voices. And so uh, I call it phases, because it seems to phase from one to the next rather than actual boom, boom, steps of change or stages of change. The first phase is prepubertal, which would be that little, little young, young childlike voice. Now we see even some, some voice change beginning there. Um, the newest uh, medical research indicates that pubescence is starting earlier and earlier, as I indicated. We're not sure why that's happening. It could be better nutrition. It could be environmental. We don't know. I tend to think it's probably the foods that we eat and things like that. They're shot up with lots of growth hormones. And um, you know, we're also seeing more cancer, more breast cancer, for instance, than we've seen heretofore. And I think a lot of it is environmental. Um, but that's a different subject. Uh, phase 2A, premenarchial. Now, I, I do use the, the onset of menstruation as, as one of the guideposts because I said this is a secondary sex characteristic. And there has been research on the fact that um, a 13 year old girl premenarchial, 13 year old girl postmenarchial, uh, Robert Duffy did this research back in the 70s. He's not a music educator, he's an old laryngologist. But there was a difference of speaking voice as much as a step and a half lower in postmenarchial mm -hmm. girls than premenarchial. So we know that that onset of menstruation is, 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 is sort of a, a herald. It makes sense. I mean, that's, it's, a, it's a hormonal issue. All right, so um, there's, and, and I think it's also important to know that, that felarchy, which is breast development, precedes menarchy about two years. So we, see, we can, you know, we're not going to get in, in, in a child's affairs, but as teachers and those that work with, we can look at a child and, and understand some of the things that are going along physiologically. But note that breast development does, does precede the onset of menstruation. So we might see early breast development here, or even in that pubertal stage, but the onset of menstruation has not occurred. Phase 2B is the high point of, of mutation for females, at least that's my, my understanding of it, and, and that is more postmenarchial. Um, ages, and let me have, hasten to say that ages are not reliable. I'm putting those up there as guideposts, but you know, you might have um, uh, that pre-pubertal pre girl, we're seeing young females start periods at 10, 11 years old. Likewise, some girls don't experience that until 13, 14, maybe even 15 years old. So everybody's different, but that gives you sort of a, a parameter anyway. And then the phase three is the young adult stage. This does not mean that they are the adult sopranos in your church choir. This means that they have, have gone through the high point of that mutation, there's a little bit more clarity in the voice, maybe even a little vibrato presents itself, but it's, it's definitely a different timbre than that little sweet girl's voice at age 8 and 10. And I just put the note there, chronological ages are given uh, as general guides and are not reliable factors. Um, I'm going to have you, uh, let's see, I'm kind of going through here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's really happening? And I'm going to refer you to uh, it will turn over one more page, how voices are made and how they function. And, and, and it's really not within the scope of this session to talk about this totally. But I, I think that it's important to know what really is going on, at least from the standpoint of adolescence. If we think about the human voice and liken it to any musical instrument, um, any musical instrument has basically three components. That's the initiator, the actuator, in this case it's the breath. Um, the phonators, which in this case are the vocal cords, the, the phonators for, for the, the keyboard are the strings. And the resonator for the keyboard is, is what? This is the soundboard. So the resonator for the female or the male different changing voice, or any voice for that matter, has to be the, the, the pharyngeal tube, as well as some of this resonance within the inside of the mouth, as well as sinuses. Those sinuses, they, we, that's more of a sensation for us as singers, they really don't have a lot of play in actually producing tone. But certainly the space inside the mouth that we talked about yesterday, the acoustical space, that has a lot to do with changing tone. So those are resonators. 
the actuator uh, or initiator for, for the piano is, is actually the, the human being that depresses the key, which in turn hits the string, which in turn sets up a series of vibrations that we hear as a piano sound. Okay? Um, so, if we understand that, the breathing process becomes it, it, it just incredibly important for all singers, but especially for young singers as well. And that's one of the things that we can train. And that's one of the things that no matter where they are in voice and voice change, we can really work with and, and give them some good skills. Um, but as far as what's happening laryngeally with the changing voice, the larynx itself is definitely growing. With male voices, we find, and, and I know this from, from good hours, um, the larynx tends to be different between the male and female larynx at this particular stage of life. Male larynx tends to grow more posterior, anterior, where female larynx is a little bit higher in, in height this way, up and down. The vocal cord, folds, or vocal cords, that's a term that's used interchangeably, um, are basically growing as well. In the male voice, one to two centimeters, in the female voice, three to four millimeters. So it's a lot different as far as, as the length of the vocal cords themselves. Also, the thickness of the vocal cords is different, male to female, especially during this time. That breadth of quality that I spoke about earlier has to do with the mutation, mutational triangle and mutational chain. This was, believe it or not, first identified in the late 1800s by some other laryngologists. And uh, what that really is, is if the vocal cords are connected in the front part here, and in the back, they're connected to the arytenoids, when we actually have the cords and duct, and, and as when we speak or when we sing, they come together, but these arytenoid cartilages are still developing, so the cords vibrate cleanly at the front, but it leaves a little bit of opening in the back. And there's where we have that breath equality. Mm -hmm. If you've ever heard of the whistle register in children's voices, and even female voices, adult female voices, and some of them have that, that's where we think that emanates from. Um, and so that breath equality is an aid. And, it, and is it something we want to get rid of? Well, I don't think we should. I think it's developmental. I think it's like God, God knows what he's doing here. But I think that a lot of the breathiness that we hear, and here's the difference, knowing the difference, um, is, is just inefficient use of voice. So that when they take that breath and they go, My country tears of the sweet land of liberty. That's inefficient use of the breath. But if we can train them, my country tis of the sweet land of liberty. Oh. They, they can manage that breath. It's still going to have that little breath quality to it, but it has to, it goes back to using the breath, metering the breath out, breath management. Ken Phillips talks about that. That's a great book, Teaching Kids to Sing by Ken, Ken Phillips. It has some wonderful vocal pieces and gives a lot more scientific information than, than you probably want to know, but if you ever do want to know, it's all in there. And he talks about child, little child voice all the way through adolescent voice as well. Um, but anyway, that's what causes that breath equality, which we don't necessarily want to get rid of, but we want to acknowledge and work with through our exercises. Breath capacity. Now, when you think of an eight-year-old girl, or you, know, you think of a, that sixth, sixth grade boy, and then the, what happens between the sixth grade boy and the eighth grade boy. <laughs> Matter of fact, there was a research study by Mincy Groom that uh, talked about the voice change in the summer of the eighth grade year into the ninth grade year for boys. And that is a huge mark. I think we're finding it earlier and earlier, however. But nonetheless, there's a huge growth spurt that occurs. So vital breath capacity changes immensely. And so the ability to take the breath, manage the breath, this, this whole muscular tour is changing. Not just here, but the physical changes that occur in the child at this age. I say child, the young person at this age. It is, is quite, quite enormous. It also affects these resonating cavities. Um, I work in, having worked with, with girls' voices, it's so interesting to me. I, one of the pleasures that I had was to, to start working with those little girls at age 8 and 9 and work with them all the way to 14 and 15. And there's a transformation that occurs with young women. It occurs with men too, but it's, they're so beautiful. I call them butterflies because they have that little round cherubic face that they come in and, and they look like little angels at eight, 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 nine years old. And then as they develop, the, you know, the facial features become more apparent and the cheekbones and this whole resonating chamber changes. 
um, they facially as they develop into adult human beings. And it's very uh, interesting to watch. And, and, and that has a lot to do with the change of timbre. That and this for guys particularly, as they grow, they get long, lean, and lanky. They might be a little, a little husky as little guys, and then all of a sudden they just sort of shoot up. I, Randall Bradley's son just amazes me. Uh, Isaac is such a handsome young man. Uh, when he was 12 years old, he did our voice soprano stuff when I first came here three years ago. And I, I know every time I see him, he says, he probably thinks, this lady doesn't know anything about me except how tall I am. Every time I go, you're so tall. You know, you're so tall. And I, it's amazing to me. But what's happening is this whole pharyngeal area is growing as well with that height, the neck, the circumference, and that is the resonator. And that's going to change the, the timbre of, of the voice. And of course, these hormonal secretion and the indicators of, of the secondary sex characteristics, the facial hair, uh, bone structure, a lot of the things that occur at, at adolescence also um, play into this, this growth of the, the total, total person. So, it, it, and, you know, I didn't. Even, this is a this uh, second little handout is another is another session. But I at least wanted to let you know the linkage with how that voice works and what's going on anatomically. If we compare the male and the female voice change, and to me, um, it's like I'm a very visual learner. Um, it's it's very much like the changes of, of, of the color spectrum. With boys' voices and girls' voices, that eight girl, boy, and girl, if we liken their voices to a particular color, let's say, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe ash or just light blue, both of those voices start out with that color, but with the male voice, it becomes blue to a royal blue to green to red to, you know, it becomes another color altogether. With female voice, it remains blue. It's always a purple voice, but from that color of blue to those different colors of blue to royal blue to male, and it becomes that that woman voice, still a treble voice, but but different. The first time I did this session, of, uh, I, I, I mentioned the session in Chicago and the UNC in 1984. I had a gentleman that come up that came up afterwards and really took me to task. He said, "You know, female voices don't change." And I and I, I didn't know much then, but I knew that that wasn't true. And I said, "Well, I have a nine-year-old that just saying I never saw him in the butterfly by Charles Davidson's." piece. And, and I said, if you know that voice, she's a nine-year-old, and I'm sure that you've heard Kathleen Battle saying, they're two different sounds, would you not agree? And he had to agree on that one. But, you know, the recognition by a lot of folks that female voices don't change was, that was the prevailing thought for many, many, many years. And thankfully, that has begun to change for sure. If we compare, and I do have this in your handout, I believe, um, Yeah, comparison of male and, and male to female adolescent voice change looks like this, sort of grid. So this is just sort of now going to take the information we've been talking about and put it in a comparison. Laryngeal growth, what occurs? Male growth is posterior anterior. And you can just think about when the bass voice really appears, we can see the protrusion of the Adam's apple, which is the thyroid cartilage, and it accommodates the growth of the vocal folds and cells. Female voices don't see the Adam's apple because the growth is more this way. Does that mean the vocal fold folds don't, don't long, elongate? No, if they do, but not as drastically as that of the male. Pitch. LTP is lower terminal pitch. UTP is upper terminal pitch. The male voice, this, the, the speaking voice, lowers about an octave, and the top usually lowers about a sixth because there is that extension from falsetto. The female voice, the, the pitch of the speaking voice lowers generally a third from like middle C down to A, A flat, something like that. And the upper extension, once maturation occurs, um, rises slightly. Resonance, both voices lack clarity, lack focus, and huskiness and breathiness is exhibited in both. From the standpoint of range, both voices, the range decreases, it, they tend to lower during the high point of change. Ultimately, both voices they will increase again. However, when the male voice increases in range, we see the direct appearance of falsetto. We don't see falsetto prior to the onset of mutation. Likewise, with female voices, that upper extension is there in the young, young voice. However, it's not as noticeable from this far as getting up and above that upper passaggio for the female voice. 
So the tessitura, meaning the comfortable singing range with, with, the, with the male voice, it tends to decrease and then begins to fluctuate. We see that same occurrence with female voices. Uh, areas that were very comfortable to sing last month might not be so comfortable to sing this month. Y'all, all of this has direct impact on the literature that we see. And just because a guy wants to be a guy, you know, with boys, if his little voice is still up here, he's going to have a hard time creating sound there. And so we find that the time to do this, or they don't sing at all, which is even worse. So then it becomes an issue of where to place them in the fire. And I, and I think that if they, if we set this up, even in our church choirs, you know, some of your voices are changing. That's just exactly the way that they should be doing. I mean, God planned it this way. So we're going to have our soprano sit here. Now, John, your voice is still in that changing process. I'm going to sit you right on the edge here. So you're going to be sitting here. You're going to have guys over here, but you're going to sit right on the edge of the soprano. So I still want you to sing soprano. That's where your voice is. That's where your voice is beautiful. It's, it's awesome when you sing there because you've got so much clarity and I need your sound there. So you sort of do a sale job, but helping them out by that boy that can't really sing tenor and still an alto. Okay, well, the alto's right here. We'll sit right on the edge. And that way he's not sitting right in the happy middle of all those girls. <laughs> but rather, he's still, you know, with the guys, but he's still vocally in the right place. Um, register development. Uh, we see transition notes, passages, if you will, throughout the change process with the male, fall seven becomes apparent, and then the transition notes or lift point uh, also occur with female voices. The adult massage becomes more apparent at the top of the staff of the female. Quality, quality of the voice doesn't mean how good. It's more tangible quality. We see drastic changes from that treble sound to the changed male sound with male voices. But the females, it changes is mostly in weight and color. And vocal instability, they're both. That's, that's the hard thing. They're kind of unstable. If you were to do unison music with these guys and girls, you're only going to have about six notes in common with changing male voice in, and, you know, I'm talking about pretty much the caveat. And that's basically an, a G below middle C up to about an E above middle C, okay? And so those notes, they can sing at pitch together. After that, the boys are probably going to displace the octave, and then they only will be able to displace just so far because they don't have much below an F. So we have to be very judicious in selecting that literature. And I have to say that Alan Pote, I think, is one of the best church choir directors. And matter of fact, probably one of the best, not, not directors, he does direct, but composers. Uh, he does understand change of voice, and he writes for that voice. And he writes quite well for it. So I think um, a lot of folks don't know that. I know when I, I commissioned Paul Bassler, you might know that name, to, to write uh, some pieces for, for me when I was in Tampa. And um, Paul said, what are they saying? And I showed him, and he did a great job of creating a piece, but a lot of composers don't know this. So, um, anyway, so let's listen a little bit. I'm now going to refer you, and I'm just uh, shooting on through this, so y'all forgive me. Um, I want you to go to, it, is, it says, adolescent voices, stages of change, male voice characteristics, and then following that, female voice characteristics. And I have the recording here for you, and I think this is so, you know, we can talk about this all day long. Um, you work with them, you know what I'm talking about, but when you, when you can hear and isolate these concepts, it makes it a little bit more clear. So this is kind of a picture's worth a thousand words. So we're going to listen to the male voice first. This is a tape, and it was done in the late 70s when John Cousy started his, his research. Um, and so it's the same boy. And that's the strength of this because you get to hear a longitudinal type of thing. Um, he's going to first um, have him count backwards from, from 20. I think he does 20 or 10. I can't remember. Anyway. And you'll note that and he, he has trouble with that, but some kids do, and I do too sometimes. But anyway, that's kind of humorous. But the reason we count backwards is if we ask them to count forwards, they go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But if they go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, that becomes a proximated pitch, and that's, it's just a quick and easy, quick and dirty way to find an average speaking pitch. And that's what he's going to do. Then he's going to have him sing in the low modal, and he does not prescribe the pitch, he just has the boy pick the pitch. And then the upper modal, and, and, and then uh, falsetto, if they can do that. And so you will not hear unchanged, but you will hear this young man start in um, the 
mid-voice one stage. Note that this voice, um, the SFF means the, the speaking fundamental frequency, is approximately A below middle C, or B flat 3, which is right above that. It's the initial pubertal period. There's some loss of clarity, some loss of flexibility and agility. They can still sing some soprano as long as it's not too hot. And, but the most uh, accepted alto part, as long as it's not too low, is they, uh, the most accepted part would be the alto. So I'll shut up and let you hear. Let's see. Teen 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.
lot of those notes, they're not going to be able to sing. This is one SAT the music really works for the best. For those, if you've got both boys in both, both of those areas. Also note that this is developing baritone. That's not a true baritone voice, you know? Does it, you know, the timbre of that. Some people even think that the previous, the cambiata sound, that's a changed voice. No, it is changing. You really don't hear the difference until you put this voice and the previous voice together. And then you hear, oh my gosh, yeah, there's a lot of timbral difference between those two. Okay? All right, let's go on to the next, the, the last one here. Four, 
male voice, mid voice one, mid voice two, all of that is changing according to the sequence. But we see Joanne Rudkowski at Penn State replicated Cooksey's study about 10 years later and found that everything was occurring with the boys that she looked at um, about a year earlier. So, and we also know that the onset administration, Dr. Tanner, who is an adolescent specialist, the onset administration in the 40s uh, with North American and, and, and Caucasian females occurred at, at approximately 14.2 years of age. By the 70s, when his book was written, it was occurring at about 12.10, and now we see it even occurring earlier. So it, the, the process is, is happening sooner, but the sequence remains the same. Um, classification in this context is in, in vocal development, not surprising tenor, that once we identify where they are in development, then we can place them on voice one. We need to listen for reclassification frequently, classify for vocal development, then place them apart, avoid labeling, I'm an alto. You might sing this tenor part. You might sing part three. You might sing part one or A or B, whatever. Uh, I think it's important they just know that, uh, you know, I sing. <laughs> they don't need to know that they're a uh, soprano alto tenor bass at this point. What they sing is what they need to know. Alternate voice parts to accommodate fluctuations, and that's really important, especially with females. Not so much with males, but for females. Don't have them always sing the alto line. Let them sing soprano sometimes. Mix them up. Okay, some of them will only sing soprano because they don't have a range down there. But for those that do, give them the opportunity to be flexible. Classification of the voice plus good literature plus vocal techniques plus organization of our rehearsal equals a musical expressive form. 